Satisfy your sweet and salty cravings at the High V Snack Sale this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, featuring High V potato chips, 98 cents, Coca Cola six packs, 2.98 each when you buy four, Little Debbie snacks in a family pack, just a dollar 48 each. Get these hot deals and so much more during the High V Snack Sale this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday only, only at High V. This is a CNA podcast. Pack your bags, you're going to a war zone. You don't hear that every day. How do you even begin to prepare to step foot on the front line of conflict? Jeremy Ko is an editor at CNA and a former Beijing correspondent. And this was his first foray into an active conflict zone. Air raid sirens like the one you just heard have pierced the skies over Ukraine every day since the war began a year ago. Some estimate they've rung 15,000 times, every time warning people of a potential airstrike. I'm your host, Teresa Tang. In this episode of CNA Correspondent, I ask Jeremy all the questions that go through my head when I see reporters on the ground in a time of war. Are they scared? How do they prepare? Do they have an exit strategy in the event of an emergency? Jeremy Coe joins me with some answers. Welcome, Jeremy. Hi, Theresa. That air raid siren, it's so unsettling. And when I hear it, it makes me feel uncomfortable and scared, frankly. How many did you hear when you were in Kyiv? And were you scared at any point during your two-week-long stint there? Well, honestly, the levels were boosted for that air raid siren. It sounded really loud and unsettling. But over there, to be honest, I didn't really hear it that much. Oh, It sounded almost every day, but it's really, really soft. So I was thinking like, you know, it's going to be, maybe it's a tier system. Like the closer it is, the louder it gets. Because at some point I was concerned, I was speaking to my colleagues and all that. I was like, okay, what if I'm asleep and I don't hear the sirens? Yeah, exactly. you know? <laughs> so I was like, okay, it's really, really soft. So Basically, we have a Telegram app, right? And they have all the air raid alerts as well. So I, I kept that on. So, I mean, the good side is that I know when there's an air raid siren. The flip side is I couldn't really sleep. It was buzzing the whole night. Oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh. So then do you take those seriously? Because you obviously have to seek shelter when you hear one of those. Not really, actually. I mean, it's been a year since the war started. So people in Kiev have gotten really used to all these air raid sirens. The first time round, we heard it, we went to seek shelter in a metro station, which is the subway station. There weren't many people around. Uh, there were still people on the streets. People weren't rushing to the shelters. And when we were in a hotel or when we were out interviewing, when we have we heard the air raid siren, we just stayed indoors. We didn't exactly run to the shelters. We had security consultants with us on the trip. So their advice for us was when there's air raid siren, just stay indoors, you'll be safe. Mm-hmm, yeah, if so. there's anything that, that needs evacuation, they'll evacuate us. Our uh, editor, your supervising editor, Clara, was pretty worried about <laughs> you was, on yeah. this trip. Uh, you and your crew, you were in Ukraine for CNA's one-year anniversary coverage of this war. So when the editor said... Hey, Jeremy, we're going to send you to Ukraine. What went through your head and how did you prepare for this assignment? Honestly, even before my boss asked me whether I was keen to go to Ukraine, I was already thinking about it. Because it's the first anniversary of the war, you know, the big ramifications for the rest of the world as well. In this part of the world, you know, food prices, inflation, all these things have affected us in this part of the world. So I was interested to see what life is like for Ukrainians who are still living in Ukraine. Many have already left, but for those who remained, I was just interested to see how life is. You're asking me how life is, how reporting in Ukraine is like. For me, I was interested in what the people there were living, you know, through. Were they in a state of panic? Were Mm -hmm. they frightened of what's happening? So that was my main concern. So when my boss asked me, you know, whether I was keen to go to Ukraine, I said, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, then he asked me, do you need to ask anyone about it? You know, I was like, no, I, I've thought about it. So I agreed on the spot. But I understand for my crew that they, they had some concerns as well. One of them took about one, two days to decide mm. um, because, I mean, there are obvious dangers, even though we were not on the front line, we were in Kiev. But even in Kiev, you know, there are missile attacks. You've heard about the strike in Kiev and also in the western city of Lviv where uh, it's relatively safe throughout the war. So yes, it looks peaceful and calm but nowhere is really safe. So were you scared at any point during your time there? Um, 
I won't say that we were really scared. We were a little tense on the eve mm. of the anniversary because we had reports that Russia was massing troops along the uh, Ukrainian-Russian border. Our security consultants, and not just them, uh, the Ukrainians were anticipating some sort of attack on Ukraine on the anniversary day itself. So um, on that day, on the eve, uh, we, we you know we got all our bulletproof vests, our helmets as well uh, in our room. So we are ready to evacuate at any point in time. So at that, you know, when I went to sleep that night, I was thinking, um, will this be the last night? No, anything can happen. But I was relatively like, I mean, our hotel were not exactly in the heart of town. You know, there were no visible landmarks nearby. So mm-hmm. I was like, I felt pretty safe. After all, I'm only there for about a week and a half. The Ukrainians have been living there for a year, you know. You talk about whether I'm scared or not. Um, you have to think about the Ukrainians as well. They've been living under this, these sorts of conditions, these sorts of threats for the last year. And there have been attacks in Kyiv. Mm-hmm. And obviously, preparing for this, you were thinking about editorial lines. But in terms of the hardware, you mentioned helmets, bulletproof vests, anything else that you had to pack that is rather unusual for an assignment? Um... Actually, I, I, I'm underpacked for this assignment. Usually, oh. I bring a lot more stuff. But for this time around, I want it to be, to be mobile. If there's anything that happened, I wanted to be able to move out fast. So, I only brought one jacket. Oh, wow. Uh, honestly, that wasn't enough. I could have, <laughs> you know, brought a lot more because it was pretty cold in Kiev at the point. It was snowing on some days as well. So, I really underpacked for this assignment. It's winter, so I could wear clothes for a few days as well. So, yeah, I packed pretty light. On the ground, journalists usually work with someone called a fixer in a foreign country. And fixers are people who assist foreign reporters trying to get a story, and they often have local expertise. Uh, How key was your fixer, and how willing were locals to talk to you about the war? Extremely key. I mean, obviously, I don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. Although there were Ukrainians who spoke English, but they were far and few between. Most Ukrainians don't really speak a lot of English. So we we had to, you know, in terms of interviewing and all that, we, we of course, we found some who spoke English, but for those who didn't, I really relied on my fixer. I thought about going there for vacations before, but that's different. Mm-hmm. This is a, an assignment. So I really needed a fixer who could help me to navigate all these things uh, and also to help me to understand what's really happening on the ground as well. And you spoke to locals. Did they seem resilient? Did they seem stricken with fear? You know, they are really, really happy to speak to us. Some of them told us that as well. And one of them even sent me a message on WhatsApp thanking me for interviewing them. I think for them, after a year of the war, they really wanted to get their stories out. They wanted people to understand their point of view. For those that stayed, I mean, obviously, there, there is some danger involved as well. Uh, one of them lives just across from a power plant. And Russia has been attacking uh, Ukraine's power infrastructure as well. So she felt it wasn't safe for her children to live there. She, so she sent them to Spain while she and her husband continued living there because men of military age cannot leave Ukraine. So she decided to stay with her husband but separated from her children. So these are the sorts of hard decisions that you have to make as well. But also... There is a lot of defiance, not just in Kiev, but also in Lviv. I spoke to some people in Lviv as well. Lviv is pretty far from the front line. It's seen as a safe haven, but even there, there is no safe place, mm-hmm. uh, like one of my interviews. So let's have a listen. Uh, there is no safe uh, place in Ukraine. You know, you never know. I'm not afraid. I'm just angry. <laughs> and I'm angry because our life is not predictable and not controllable. Millions of Ukrainians have fled the country, but as you say, Jeremy, some can't bear to leave their lives behind. As you walked around the streets of Ukraine, what struck me in your TV stories were the remnants of war that we saw. There were destroyed tanks, armored vehicles that were lining the streets. Can you tell us about them? How close did you get and what struck you about them? You know, there were quite a few, um, maybe a dozen of uh, tanks as well as uh, captured Russian vehicles in front of a very iconic square in Kiev. That's like the heart of Kiev as well. They were put there on parade for the Ukrainians to, you know, just take pictures. And, you know, there almost a festive atmosphere there as well. People were there taking selfies and all that. Mm-hmm. But it's also a reminder that this war is ongoing. As you drive around Kiev, you see some Czech hedgehogs, which are like metal beams, um, you know, which you put across the road to prevent tanks from advancing. There were also sandbags. Like in Lviv, I, I didn't really notice it in Kiev, but in Lviv, some churches, you know, their windows were all bordered 
boarded up, some sandbags on the ground floor as well, so to protect these churches in the event of any attack. In Kiev, there were some monuments that were covered up in uh, sandbags as well, especially in the square that I was talking about with all the Russian tanks and the captured Russian vehicles. So it's a reminder that things are not normal. By day, it's fairly bustling, you know, in Kiev, people are on the streets, lots of cars and pedestrians as well. But by night, by sunset actually, uh, the city basically empties out. Um, mm. It's really empty because there is a curfew by 11pm. So restaurants and shops close by 9, by 8 plus actually, so that their staff have time to get home before the curfew. But indoors, you know, in the, the restaurants, it still looks fairly bustling. Things are normal. You still get nice food. We had nice pizza. We had nice <laughs> Ukrainian food and all that. Yeah. So there is some normalcy amidst some normalcy, the war. Yes. And those vehicles that you were talking about, I noticed some were beginning to rust, actually, which yeah. is a reminder of just how long this conflict has already been raging. The world watching, willing peace to arrive in Kiev. But Jeremy spoke to some who decided to take things into their own hands to help. That's after the break. Hello everyone, my name is Crispina. And I'm Adrian. And we're the hosts of a podcast called Work It. If you've never heard of it, well, it's a good time to tap in. In the last 20 episodes, we've discussed topics like how to negotiate for a salary increase. Or how to get along with younger colleagues who have different values from you, which incidentally is our top performing episode. If work consumes your life and you want some perspective on issues like management, stress, even office romance, then this podcast should be on your list. A new episode drops every Monday. Catch us on the CNA app or wherever you get your podcasts. Jeremy, it's one thing to watch the conflict unfold, but some abandoned their armchairs, they hopped on a plane, and they went to Ukraine to offer humanitarian assistance. And you spoke to some of these people from Asia. Why did they do that? Well, when I spoke to them, there, there was a very strong sense that they were helping to defend democracy. They felt that if Russia wins the war, it's a very bad sign for democracy around the world as well. So that's why, you know, there are people who volunteered to be soldiers. There are people who volunteered, you know, to do other stuff, provide uh, medicine. I spoke to people not just from Asia, but from Africa as well. Uh, but one guy really struck me. He's a Japanese. He basically, he has no background. He's has, he has no military background at all. His background is in forestry. But uh, after the war broke out, he decided to fly all the way to Ukraine to on, volunteer. On his own dime, right? On his own dime, of yeah. course. Uh, to, to fight on the side of the Ukrainians alongside this volunteer army, which is led mostly by ethnic Georgians. So he had no background. He barely spoke English. I had to speak to him through an interpreter. So this guy who has no background, he's fighting on the front lines, like what he told me. So for him, I mean, I asked him whether he was afraid. He said that it's normal to feel fear and all that. Uh, but as for whether he spoke to his family members, what was the reaction from them? Let's have a listen. I didn't tell my family members. I told two of my close friends. One of them told me not to go. The other said that if that was what I had decided, I should follow my will. Wow, that's really astounding that someone would be so convicted and so impassioned that they would just hop on a plane regardless of what anyone thought. You spent an evening of your visit to Kiev in the basement of one of the city's best hotels. And you were told to keep the details of your location very hush-hush, right? Because Super th- hush-hush. that was where <laughs> President Volodymyr Zelensky was holding a news conference. Okay, we've all seen Mr. Zelensky speak in clips on TV, and I'm just captivated every time he speaks. What is it like seeing him in person? I think the first thing that really strikes you is that he re- really appears like he does on TV. I mean, he was somber at times when, you know, he's talking about more solemn topics. And he's also pretty humorous at times. Uh, there was one Azerbaijani reporter who requested a selfie with him in the middle of the press conference. Oh, oh my and gosh. President Zelensky basically obliged him, <laughs> even though, you know, his his probably his chief of staff who was just beside him said that it's a bad idea, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's just do one and let's not do any more. But the press conference, like, he, he was very engaging as well, like what he is on TV. You know, I watched his drama series, Servant of the People. Oh, did you? Yeah, I'm in season two right now, by the way. (laughs) You know, that was the the drama series that really, you know, helped to propel him to the presidency. He really appears like what he does on TV. So uh, that was the first thing that struck me. 
Yep. And that press conference in the basement of a hotel was a bit unusual as well for you? Super unusual. It was held under, you know, utmost secrecy as well. Mm-hmm. Like even hours before the press conference, we didn't know where it was. We were only told to report to this venue, which was the Intercontinental Hotel in Kiev. Uh, we thought that we were just there to register and we would be bussed off to another area. But lo and behold, you know, the press conference was held in the basement of that hotel. Mm. Uh, so we went there. We were told that we were not supposed to divulge any information that could lead to the people guessing where this venue is until the end of the press conference for security reasons, of course. Uh, so it was a very interesting experience, to say the least, because we've attended lots of press conferences. Yeah. None of them were held, you know, under such situations. Wow. Yeah. And you also made it to Bucha. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar, that's an outlying region that Russian troops briefly occupied for about a month last year. But there's deep trauma in this region. How deeply did you sense it when you were there? Even when you drive into Bucha, which is about 40 minutes away from Kiev, actually, um, the signs of the war are much more apparent. As you drive in, you arrive to Lupin, you see this bridge, which was blown up by the Ukrainians to stop the Russians from advancing towards Kiev. So these structures, this structure was in ruins. Uh, as you drive further in, you see signs of shrapnel on buildings, residential buildings. There were buildings that were bombed as well. You, you might remember the horrific scenes from last year, the pictures of dead bodies strewn on the streets. That was in Bucha. Mm-hmm. So understandably, the people there are probably more affected by the war. Uh, I spoke with some of them, you know. There was one lady in particular, you know, I, I went to her house. She was just doing something around the house. I was outside, I was looking in. So I asked my fixer, can we speak to this person? So we spoke to her. She really opened up to us, you know, shared her story. She said her son was tortured by the Russians. Of course, we can't prove that, but that was uh, something that she said. They're in the midst of rebuilding the house as well. Uh, but there's a lot of anger because she used to go to Russia when she was younger as well. So, so let's have a listen. We were living normally. We were like brothers. I used to go to Moscow when times were good. Everything was fine. And now, I don't know. I don't know how to describe Putin. I can't believe that such people exist. It's very hard. It's very hard to endure. I became very nervous. I had only this war in my head, and that was it. I can't sleep normally. Security, obviously, key when you are in a war zone. Can you tell us about the security team that you were with? Were you escorted uh, throughout this trip? We had uh, security consultants throughout the trip. So, I mean, these were people who were supposed to help to look out for our security and safety as well. So, I mean, on the eve of the anniversary, that was the most tense uh, of all the days that we spent there. So they, they told us what we should do if something happens. We were supposed to, you know, just bring our bulletproof vests, our helmets to our rooms and, you know, have them with us at all times. If push comes to shove, we would evacuate uh, Kiev at the soonest, uh, earliest opportunity. So that means just bringing everything down, you know, to our vehicles and just to drive out. Uh, would that be a traffic jam if, you know, something really happens? Probably. But uh, according to them, because we are leaving without family, without pets, without anything, we would be the fastest out of the city. So before we went to sleep that night, we were told to pack everything in our bags. So if anything happens, we can just grab and go. So that, that was why that night was the most tense among, you know, all the nights that I spent in Kiev. And honestly, how did you feel when you landed back here in Singapore? Um... From Ukraine, we left uh, to Poland. So there was really some sort of normalcy in Poland. Uh, We had two days to sort of decompress in Poland before we flew back to Singapore. But back in Singapore, you know, things are back to normal. Um, I'm doing this interview with you. I've been speaking, talking about Ukraine. Uh, Lots of people are interested. My friend's family have asked me lots of questions about Ukraine as well. We spoke to a lot of people. They were very emotionally affected. You feel for them. And hopefully, you know, the war would end soon so that people can move on with their lives. The refugees outside uh, of Ukraine can go back because there are lots of refugees who are outside Ukraine and they are stuck in limbo right now. You ask them what are their plans, they have no plans because how can they plan for their life? So these people are really stuck in limbo. Their, their lives are just... Um, so they disrupted. Plan. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking us to Ukraine and sharing the Ukrainian story. And I'm so glad you made it back to Singapore safe and sound. Thank you. (laughs) The TV version of CNA Correspondent airs on CNA every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Catch up with them anytime on cna.asia.
The team behind this episode is Saya Wynn, Clara Ong, Crispina Robert, and me, Teresa Tang. Until next time. <laughs>